problem with a gig like this. Basically, Ted's all about the best ideas and ideas we're spreading and all that kind of stuff. And here's the, so I thought, so I thought, do I have an idea that's actually worth spreading? Because I've got lots of ideas. Most of them actually kind of involve monkeys. You give me the 12 smartest, strongest monkeys with like a really good sense of humor, I could change the world. But that's an idea ahead of its time. So I thought, so do I have an idea? Which, and then you start sort of thinking back over your life and stuff that you've learned, and you think, well, what have I kind of learned along the way? And I thought, well, there was that time that old dead bloke vomited in my mouth. That was, that was one time. Yeah, so long story short, so I'm 14. 14, and I'm doing CPR, right? I ended up doing CPR on this old bloke who was dead. I didn't know he was dead. A doctor would later confirm his deadness. I began to suspect part way through, though. So I'm busy doing CPR, and I discovered a couple of things. Um, one, I made a rookie mistake, and two, I had been lied to, profoundly lied to, because the rookie mistake was I took his false teeth out. <laughs> Don't take the false teeth out, because if you take the false teeth out, their face basically collapses into a big rubbery hole. <laughs> I know. And the bit that I've been profoundly lied to about is that basically you do the CPR practice on the rubber dummies and it's all plastic and Listerine. When you do it on an actual human being, as you're pushing down, pushing down they make sort of gurgling sounds. You blow in the first time, they're blowing in the first one, not so bad. But as soon as you take your mouth off, it all... <laughs> and you're... <laughs> I know. So I was doing CPR on him, and it was the worst, like 14, it was, the, it was horrible. It was the worst thing I'd ever done. And I didn't want to look at him because he was freaking me out because he was looking really dead. So <laughs> up on the wall, there was this picture, and it was this watercolor picture of these two Chinese junks. And I just kept staring at that the whole time because I thought, if I look back at him, I'm not going to be able to do the breathing in part. And you have to do the breathing in part. Like, you can't just saying this isn't very nice doesn't cut it in this moment. His whole life has come down to you, you plonker, so keep going. So <laughs> I remember staring at this picture, and I can still see it in my mind now, this little picture of these watercolor junks up on the wall there. Um, and uh, he, I kind of had these ideas that he would wake up and you know, we'd become friends and he'd tell me war stories and leave me all his money. and <laughs> Didn't happen. But I learned this, and it kind of has carried me through a lot of different situations. Whenever I've had to do something really bad, I always think, well, it could be worse. It could be an old dead bloke vomiting in your mouth. <laughs> you see, fundamentally, I'm interested in kind of how things work, really. I mean, technically, I'm a clinical psychologist, but really, I'm a bit of a traveler. I just want to see how the world works, and I'm a pragmatist, and I want simple rules. I don't want complex stuff. I just want to know, tell me something that works, very simply, so that if I do it, things will generally get better. So along the way, I've sort of paid attention to things. So you grow up a bit, you go off and you become a psychologist. That was all real. Most of my work was with child, youth and family. So it was with really difficult kids and difficult families. And I used to go out to a social work office and work out of there a couple of afternoons a week. And one afternoon, uh, in the middle of the afternoon, this little kid wanders in. One of their kids, a foster kid, had been in care for years. Uh, and he wasn't, I wasn't seeing him, but he walked in and he lay down in the corner of the room. He just put his hands over his eyes like that and he wouldn't talk to anyone. And so a couple of hours worth of social workers trying to talk to him, and because it's in my nature, I said, well, can I go and have a chat? So I walked in, sat down, he still wasn't talking, and I did all the usual things, blah, 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 um, but he wasn't saying anything. So then we sat there in silence for a bit, and I thought, do you know what? People have been taking from this kid his whole life. He's been in care for years, and I'm just doing what everybody else does. Tell me what's wrong with you so that you can help us to figure it out. So I thought, no, no, you have to give the boy something. So I said to him, I said to him, do you know what? You've probably spoke to lots of people like me. You've done lots of counselling. You've probably done those little sand tray things where you put the little sand in the animals and interpret your behaviour and all that kind of stuff. I said, would you like to learn how to fuck with the people who do sand trays? <laughs> now, you may not like that word, and some of my colleagues don't think it's terribly appropriate to use that word with a boy of 10 years old. But I didn't say it for them, or you, I said it for him. Because he did this, he went. <laughs> See, here's what you do. Take everything out of the sand tray, right? Take all the little animals and the soldiers and stuff, put them on the side, smooth all the sand over, smooth, smooth, smooth. Then dig a hole right in the middle, dig it all the way down to the bottom. Then get the little baby, there's always a little baby. Get the little baby, put that in the hole, 
bury it in sand, bury it, pat it down, get all the fences, put all the fences around the baby, get the soldiers, the little plastic soldiers with guns all pointing in, then get all the wolves and tigers and stuff all pointing in, then get like a little chicken or a little puppy, little puppy's always best, get the little puppy, put that in the corner of the sand tray facing away, and then you must just sit there. And I said, this is the important bit. This is the important bit. The, the therapist will then ask you either one of two things, and the answer must always be the same. They will either point to the little buried baby, or they'll point to the little plastic puppy in the corner, and they'll say, who's that? You must always say, it's me. <laughs> By this stage, he was sitting up, and he was talking about how, yeah, we could probably put in some other stuff. We could put in some broken glass and snakes and some bombs and stuff like that. And then I just said, so what's going on? And he told me. And he told me because I gave him something first. And that's a lesson I kind of carried all the way through my career. So you, that's give, and then you ask for stuff. So then you go along through your life. And uh, then uh, my dad, who was a good guy, got, got bowel cancer. And symptoms of bowel cancer, right? It's abdominal pain, it's bleeding, it's changes in your bowel motion, masses, stuff like that. If anyone has those symptoms, we go and get checked, don't we? That's when you go, yes, Nigel, we do. <laughs> right. So he got bowel cancer, and bowel cancer kills a lot of people, and it doesn't need to. We didn't catch it in time. He kind of went through that thing, and he got a little bit better, and then we thought he was all right, and then it didn't, and it came back. The last time I saw him, this thing happened. So he, I'd been down, because we were living up the other end of the country, so I came in, and he was in bed, and I just, you know, keeping it all upbeat and stuff. Right, see you in a week, because I'll come back in a week's time. And uh, I just bent down to give him a hug to say goodbye, and he did this thing, like he kissed me on the cheek. And I, I remember thinking, because he'd never done that. He'd never done, kissed me on the cheek. He was, a, he, was a, he was a great dad, very affectionate, careless with fingers. Yeah. When, he was, <laughs> when he was a young builder's apprentice, he, was, <laughs> he lost two on a bandsaw. Alvin, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> and he like, was a musician, so that was quite hard. Um, but he was a good. But he'd never kissed me on the cheek, and so uh, he did this. And uh, you know, I said, "Sorry, I'll, I'll see you in a week's time." I'll see you in a week's time. Uh, so I didn't, because he died on the morning that I was supposed to come back. And um, <clears throat> wasn't going to do that anyway. Right. So, uh, but I remember thinking, like, when I didn't make it back, I remember thinking, you know, at first that was quite hard. But then I remembered that time, that that last little thing he did, that kiss on the cheek that he'd never done. And I thought, I didn't need to. Like, it, there was nothing else we needed to say. Like, that, that was all that he ever needed to say to me about our relationship. And, it, and, I, and, I, and I remember thinking, you need to recognize the important moments that happen in our lives. Because they're not always, you know, rockets and, and, and fireworks and all that stuff. Sometimes it's these small, quiet things. And you need to recognize them because those are the things that resonate down through your entire life. Then you have children, right? Now... My little guy was just born just before my dad died, uh, and, and a couple of years after my dad died, uh, we discovered that carelessness with fingers runs in the family. <laughs> so he had his finger, he was about two, had his finger on the hinge side of the door, his brother closed the door. See, mums always go, <sighs> dads always go, God, you would have been stuck at the hospital for hours, mate. <laughs> Cuts the end of his finger off. Blood everywhere. I've been out walking the dog. I come back. Dog's happy. Licks up all the blood. <laughs> We're scooping him up to go. And I, they're like, Ringo, the dog gave me this look. He's saying, do you want the rest of that? <laughs> yes, we do. Took him to the hospital. Got to see the surgeon. She had a look and she said, yeah, we can attach the end of that because his nail had come off. Where's the, you know, where's the nail with the nail bed? And I remember thinking, mm. <laughs> hang on, because we chucked it in the bin. Well, because it was a manky little bit of finger. So I raced home, went through the bin. I bought three things back. Because <laughs> there were at least three things that looked like the end of a small boy's finger. <laughs> Turns out one was a bit of orange, a bit of bacon, and the end of a small boy's finger. <laughs> they stitched it back on. It was fine. But it was one of those really stressful moments. And it's like, it really kind of, and it's always when you're at places like that at hospitals with your kids that you re it really does hammer home to you that your life isn't your life anymore. Like, they literally become your heart. Your happiness doesn't reside within you anymore. It resides outside of you in them. And if they're happy, you're happy. And if they're not, you're not. And I remember 
when I kind of finally understood this, I just thought, well, that's just bloody great, isn't it? <laughs> that's just great. It's hard enough to be happy just with my own life. But now basically what you're saying is, unless he's happy and his brother as well, probably chuck his mum into the mix. That's it. Fantastic. <laughs> but they do. They become your heart. So I kind of, that's a, your heart lives it. And then, you see, you go on, you're raising children, you're still working your career, doing that stuff, and then you start doing tally stuff, right? Which is, that's what you do. You end up there. Everyone does, eventually. Um, <laughs> when you can't do anything else, you end up in tally. And um, I've got to do some pretty interesting things. I went to the Antarctic um, earlier this year, um, and it was astounding, and it was beautiful and amazing, uh, and I've always wanted to go there. And um, discovered something quite interesting. Like, and you were scientists working in one of the most hostile places on Earth, answering some of the biggest, most important questions on the planet. And I thought, what was the biggest learning that I got from the Antarctic? And it was probably that penguins are complete assholes. <laughs> it was a surprising thing, not what I expected to learn. Because what happens is you go there, and there's a penguin with a little baby, a little brown baby. And I just thought, oh. And then this big skewer comes along, and it doesn't creep. It basically, if it ninja up, but it basically just waddles up like that, stabs the little baby penguin, and is dragging it off, eating it alive. And the other penguin, basically, the mum penguin or dad penguin, they just go, oh, yeah, typical. <laughs> you feel as if, at least mount a verbal argument. <laughs> Don't just walk off. So there was that. And we made the parenting show, right? And the thing I liked about the parenting show is we said, basically, people, people liked it because it made them feel better about parenting. Because we actually said, you know what? You don't have to be perfect. It's really hard to mess your kids up. Most of us don't have the energy to mess our kids up. I couldn't. You've got to stay up all night drinking and fighting and smashing stuff. <laughs> I could do that for like a Friday night, but come Saturday night, I'll be like, oh, can we just, can we just not drink and fight and smash stuff? Because I've got, <laughs> got sore back. And then we made the crime show. We made a crime show about uh, you know, why people do bad things. And so we think, oh, we'll move along. They'll edit this out. It'll be fine. I'll fix it in post. There we go. <laughs> we made the crime show. And uh, that was about you know, bad things had done, you know, bad people had done bad things to people. Um, and uh, it was a really hard series to make because it meant going to families and saying, you know, we would always go to the victims' families and get their consent first, because it's not just TV, it's not just an hour of entertainment, it's people's lives, and if we couldn't convince them it was worth doing, then we shouldn't be doing it. So we went along and we did that. Um, but there's something about sitting in someone's house whose daughter, I sat in a family's house, their 15-year-old daughter was raped and murdered, talking to them about what that whole thing was like. Um, and you learn that words don't always reach. Words are great for lots of things, but words don't always reach into the places that we need them to reach. And then, of course, we made a series, doco series, about a bunch of things, including sugar and inequality and stuff like that. And one of them was the prison thing. And I went to prison, which uh, was OK. But we joked too much, and we didn't focus on the task at hand, because we'd been thinking about going to prison for a long time, but never actually had the discussion about how, how much of the strip search we would need to film. <laughs> we never got to that point. I realized this, I was in the van going out to prison. And so basically we got to the prison and it just, we, it just never got to the stop point. And another low point in my life was when the man says, right, pass me your underpants and squat down. And you do that because basically anything clenched between your buttocks will drop out onto the ground. There will then be an awkward silence and you will go, oh, I've never seen that before. <laughs> Seems like I always learned your mum's right, always wear clean undies. <laughs> But if I was to think about the whole thing, if I was to think about all the stuff that I've done, I do think there are some basic, there's a basic and simple principle that I think there's a fundamental idea underlying anything that I've ever been a part of that's worked or done any good. And it's really simple. Because it was there up in that room with that old man doing CPR, right? And you're just trying not to give in to that basic human weakness of this is gross, I don't want to do it, by focusing on that little painting because you know that you have to keep going. And it was there all through my kind of career with these kids when what you're trying to do is actually to improve their lives a little bit. And it was the stuff that my dad showed me in terms of how he raised me, and it was that last thing that he gave me that last time that I saw him. And it's part of what I've tried to do with my children all the way along. And I think it's also part of what's underlined the successful television stuff. It's this really simple thing. Make 
people's lives better. It's an old idea. <laughs> it's a really simple idea. And I don't just mean it like a t-shirt um, or a slogan. I mean it as a practice, as an actual code. The things that I'm the most proud about, about the TV series, is not being on TV. Because being on TV is neither substantive nor important. What I'm proud about is that I was a part of a team of people who made television that had an impact on people's lives. In the crime show, The Darkland Show, there was a woman who'd been sexually abused when she was a kid. No one believed her. She got to say on national TV that it happened, and people believed her. And she said it was like this great weight was lifted from her. The, the, when we screened the serious doco series, people changed their diets as a result of that. People drank less alcohol. I got an email from a woman saying that after the, 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 the domestic violence episode, her husband watched it with her, and then he said, I need to go out and go to a group. So he went to a group to change his violent behavior. That's important stuff. So for me, when I think about an idea that's worth spreading, I think make people's lives better that's one that's worth spreading, and not just as an idea, but as a code of practice, so that you use it as a roadmap. If you're faced with a moment, you think, what's going to make a difference? If you're sitting at home typing stuff out onto the internet, before you type that comment, think, is it going to make anybody's life better doing this stuff? You know, if you're dealing with people that you work with or work for, if you build a business that makes people's lives better, then your business is going to grow and succeed. If you're a, you don't have to go and you know, build orphanages in Africa and change your whole life. And it's small things every single day. It's making people feel like they're important, making them feel like they matter. That, I think, is an idea that's worth spreading. Thank you.